Before I donated my kidney to Ephra, I did not have an opinion on organ donation. The whole concept was completely new to us. We have nobody in the family that has kidney problems. We'd never heard of any of this. We were like, you kind of associated it with an elderly person, to be honest. As a teacher, as somebody who was always interested about organs, I would always say it's a very good thing. that when I met Sina 20 plus years prior and she'd got her driving license at the age of 18, she told me that she'd donate her organs because she got used to get the card. And so that stuck with me. And then you fast forward 26 plus years and we're having a conversation about our son and we didn't think twice. Today we are climbing Ben Nevis, which is the highest peak in the UK primarily because it's such a challenge and all of us that are climbing today we may be first climbers but we all have good health and vitality and you know we're all going to reach the top inshallah we'll get this to the summit but we're doing this to raise awareness of all the people that are on the organ donation list and they have no call to life because they're waiting for life-saving organs in this community uh, a lot of people have a lot of different uh, 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 questions and issues concerning organ donation and this walk is basically to try and highlight uh, the issues and answer as many questions as possible from lots of different people in the field. So the law changed recently into the opt-out law which means that everyone automatically is an organ donor. As an imam in the community, people were asking me basic questions whether it's permissible or not. So I, I decided to research this topic. I didn't realise that it was a taboo subject. I, To me, it logically made sense. It's something that we should all kind of aim for because it's a way of helping somebody. And then it wasn't until I started talking to my parents about it that I was told it was a sin. This topic is controversial because it cuts across a number of theological uh, positions. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's authority and his ownership over our body. Um, burying uh, the, the dead body as quick as possible and also um, honouring and dignifying the human being. So I'm Rafaq al-Rashid um, and I'm uh, by occupation uh, a general practitioner. Uh, so I'm somebody who's had a, a quite immense interest in uh, Islamic medical ethics for over 20 years now. There are a number of myths that do exist in the, uh, in the Muslim community regarding organ transplantation. You know, doctors, when they know that you're uh, a donor, then they, what they will do is they'll undergo processes where they'll quicken your death. So that is another, uh, another myth that exists, that basically there's an issue of mafsada, so there's an issue of uh, uh, organs uh, or there being a market for organs and there's a sense of exploitation, people benefiting financially from this. We have a health system here that's more ethical than in other places in the world, which means that our rulings are going to be different here than they would be, say, in Pakistan. And that's really important to say that because a lot of our scholars here, our local scholars, say that organization is permissible with the caveats and that is within this health system where we're seeing. So according to my research, organ transplantation is permissible but with conditions. And one very important aspect of this that uh, we talk about is the issue of what we call a dhurura, so the principal necessity. We'd always plan to do Hajj together, it was one of our big, you know, post-retirement things. But just out of the blue, I just said to Nasa, I said, do you know what it is? I think we should do Hajj now. We were in Makkah towards the having done Umrah, going towards, obviously we were planning to go to Medina. This is after the Hajj. Nasa woke up in the morning, uh, one morning we were in a really lovely hotel, really, really in pain. Abdominal pain, really extreme. He was screaming with pain. And a Pakistani doctor came and he saw him took him into, checked him over. And we, you know, came back to England after a eight, 10 hour flight. People were very shocked to see him. And you've seen the photos probably of him in my um, posters. He was so dark. His color had changed totally. And he'd lost probably over the period of Hajj, at least, you know, half a stone. When I got back on Monday, I phoned the doctor and said, look, we need uh, an urgent appointment. He said, no, sir, you know, You've got fluid on your liver, your liver's expanded. 
and you now need to transport. My liver and I will be called finisher. Anytime it will be failed and you will die. I said, oh my God. We decided and we'll tell the doctor, okay, then go ahead. And after, I was lucky after one week, I got the donation. Before the transplant, I was in the dunya, you know. Do this business, do this building, do this property, like this, this, this. After the transplant, honestly, I completely changed. Complete, I don't know what happened. Allah changed me so much. कि बस मैं यही है कि अल्लाह तारा ने पता नहीं मेरे मुझसे कुछ काम लेना है समझे ना ये मुझे जो लाइफ दी है ना अल्लाह ताला ने ये कुछ काम करने के लिए दी है तो मैंने आओ ये अंग्रेज था चालीस साल का बचारा मैं तो उसके लिए दुआ मांगूं कि अल्लाह ताला उसको उस पे अपना कर्म करे और उसकी फैमिली पे भी Organ transplantation is a very new technology. Um, the first successful heart transplant happened in 1965. So there isn't anything directly in the Quran or in the Sunnah which speaks for or against. So the issue of organ transplantation is an issue of ijtihad, which means it's, a, it's an issue where expert opinion is required. So you're gonna, you will have some diversity in opinion. That's, ex that's an expectation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the children of Adam is dignified. So human beings have dignity. Now people who believe that organ transplantation and organ donation is haram, they will say that the fact that somebody after death, their bodies get cut up, um, that is against the dignity of the human being and therefore it goes against this verse of the Quran. Whilst others who believe that organ transplantation is permissible, they will argue that if that one person who's dying, even after death, that person was to help somebody else and somebody else lived, then this is sadaqah, this is charity, and therefore that is in line with the dignity of, of the human being or line in, or with, with the ayat. There's a, quite a bit of confusion about brain death and it, is this proper death as we would see it from an Islamic perspective. In other words, in Islam, it's when the soul leaves the body. There is no cognition there is no awareness, there is no wakefulness state. The person is no longer there permanently. So if we were to take out an essential organ, it's as no different to putting the life support machine off. So in this sense, Muslim scholars are accepting the idea that you can retrieve an organ, an essential organ for somebody who is brain dead, even if you were not to accept brain death as actual proper death. Some people believe that they will be resurrected organless um, in the Day of Judgment. Again, we don't really know what the nature of resurrection is. Um, is it the same body? Is it a different body? All we know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to resurrect us in, in our natural state. In our natural state basically means that in the state, even it comes in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu says that men will also be resurrected uncircumcised in the natural state that they were born. Yeah, so there is, a, there is a question about can Muslims receive organs from non-Muslims? Uh, and the, the straightforward answer to that is if organ transplantation is considered as permissible under certain conditions, then it doesn't really make a difference whether it's from a Muslim or non-Muslim. The reason why these questions arise in people's mind is because for some uh, reason people think that kufr or disbelief can be transferred through one's organs. That is not the case. The Prophet ﷺ was nursed, you know, he drank the milk of uh, four women who were not Muslims. So, from being told your organs are your organs, they need to stay in your body, otherwise you go to hell. Um, instead, during my research, I kind of found, well, actually it is okay to, to donate your organs. Um, and if it's a live donation, it's, virtuous as long as you're not really incapacitating yourself or handicapping yourself in doing it. So if you donate your kidney and you can happily survive without that kidney, then it's a very virtuous thing to do. Um, I was first introduced to the whole kidney failure when I was 11. Yeah, so at that time I, I don't remember a huge amount of it because I was like extremely ill because it was, it was uh, my kidneys had failed to the point where there was like no return. Um, so at that point I, I was, they pretty much said, you know, come and say your goodbyes. So it was, it was a lot more 
serious um, back then. When I made the choice to donate the kidney, it was really easy. It was, if I need help, I don't need two kidneys. Uh, the doctors assured me I would be absolutely fine with one kidney and it would help to save Ifra's life. We were told that we always need another transplant, so that wasn't a surprise. However, it came quicker than we expected. Uh, so second transplant, so both my brothers actually came forward uh, to be tested, um, but it was the hero of the family, this guy next to me right here, <laughs> uh, my younger brother, uh, Deal. Like I said, it was 2019 when she told me and my brother about it, um, and I think when she told us, we both of us were like, how, how can we put ourselves forward? And then it was maybe about a month or so after that the, the hospital kind of phoned me and said that, okay, we kind of assessed both of you, and because you're in a job, you're, you're married, you're, um, you're more mature, um, they were like, we think you'll, you'll be a better match. I'm not, I've, I've fine. I don't think there's, there's been any impact. There's obviously the after the transplant, there's like a, a 12 week recovery period. So during then, I was like, I was kind of like quite quite weak and thing that I had to watch what I was doing. But then I think after that, there's been no barrier, there's no risk. What, what we said is there shouldn't be any change to your day to day life after giving um, a kidney. The only risk is during the actual operation. So over the 18 years since the operation within six weeks i was back at work and i felt fine and um, since then my health has been very good uh, the grace of god and i've had two children and i've been healthy i'm still playing football i'm still playing badminton and i think there's been no overall effect in my life at all um, other than it's been great to see Ifra grow up as well in that time. I think uh, every time I see them th together, and it, it doesn't matter like how long it's been, it's um, it hits me like every single time. Just just how lucky like I'm blessed there. <laughs> yeah, like I know like if it, if it wasn't for them, like I, I don't know like I hate to think how long I'd be waiting. So a living donor is usually a healthy individual um, uh, that chooses to donate usually to a loved one or altruistically to a stranger. Um, and you know, more, there's more than a thousand of these that do this every year and, and, and most of these are people who donate um, a kidney. Um, you can also donate a part of a liver. Um, whereas a deceased donor is somebody who donates after they've died, obviously, and they can donate um, their heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, small bowel. So they've got a you know potential, I guess, to transform and ch change up to eight lives uh, as, as, a, as a deceased donor. Um, so once consent has been sought, um, uh, then an in independent specialist team of organ retrieval surgeons like myself and our nursing staff are called to the um, to the hospital to carry out the organ retrieval operation. It's a, it's a very important and quite an emotional operation. Respect and dignity are at the forefront of everybody's mind. You know, that's, uh, that's a really important thing to, to, to say. Um, and before we actually start the operation, we, we take a moment of silence and reflect on what we're about to do. The operation itself involves a, a cut from the top of the chest to the bottom of the tummy in the, in the middle. Um, we dissect carefully and delicately and the organs have to be removed in such a way that they are not damaged, that they are in an optimal state to be transplanted. So you can have an open casket funeral, you know, because the, you know, and the dressing will cover from the top of the chest to the bottom of the tummy. The, the, the body is then washed and cleaned, and, and if, if the donor's family have any particular requests, they are undertaken. So some family uh, members, they want, you know, like palm prints. Some family members want the, uh, pay, uh, their loved one dressed in a particular dress. Um, some members want particular music played at the end and then the body is returned to, to the family and, um, and then taken to mortuary thereafter. Unfortunately, um, a, a small, but luckily a small but not an insignificant number of children on our intensive care uh, unit that we look after die. 
And as, a, as the process of end of life care, we always ask the question about whether organ donation it would be something that they consider or have considered. And increasingly, actually, we find that families bring it up during that process. So it was, it was a pretty normal Sunday, um, late in November, Christmas was coming up, the nights were colder, um, and Celia went to do what normally most people do, which is she went to the supermarket. Um, I had Ari, Asha and Isla with me. Ari had asked me if he, he could have a yogurt with his sisters, so I took him downstairs. He also asked me if he could watch Peppa Pig. I went upstairs. For, for me, it seemed like anything between eight to 10 minutes before Cena had come back. Um, and that's something that will live with me for the rest of my life. Uh, I will always blame myself for not being there should he have wanted me. Uh, because in those minutes, he managed to get himself caught in the blind cord and suffocate. On Sunday evening, Ari was admitted to the paediatric unit at St George's. Um, he was put on life support and there was no indication that Ari would not survive. Um, ev everyone from the medical team, for be it nurses or doctors, um, done everything they could to try and um, bring Ari back to us. Um, it was completely random. I caveated it with, he's going to be okay though. But if it comes to that point, and that's when I asked Jay, I said, would you consider donating his organs? And obviously Jay said, he said yes. And that was the only bit of conversation we had. But straight away I said, but well, he'll be fine. He'll come home and we'll do what we need to do and care for him however we need to care for him. And it was me seeing a, uh, the consultant and a nurse and they said and explained that the, the swelling on Ari's brain had, had um, got worse and over the next 72 hours his organs would deteriorate um, and effectively Ari would, would pass. Um, I think it was that point that Sina then said, save Ari's organs uh, and help him save others' lives. I don't know if it's the right thing, words to say, but I, I get joy from the fact that he has been able to save two other children and they are alive and have had normal lives, pretty normal lives, uh, because of him. It was actually on the day of Ari's funeral, we got the update, that he was able to uh, donate his heart and that went to a girl um, who was at the, about five at the time and then his other organs, his liver, his pancreas, his stomach, his bowel went to, all went to another little boy who was about the same age as Ari. The boy that received um, five of Ari's organs was, it was the first time ever in the UK that someone so young had received um, organs from one, uh, from one donor. donor. Uh, but you imagine how poorly that child would have been to have needed that many organs. And for the fact that he is still alive and probably of the same age as Ari now, um, is phenomenal. Uh, Ari said one thing to his uh, grandma the week before he, he died. He said that he wanted his mom and dad to be proud of him. And if I think about those words that he shared with his gran and think about Ari's legacy. I'm truly proud that Ari, um, uh, of what Ari's done and what he's done for others. Uh, I always said it was never my gift to give. It was always Ari's gift to give others. And he's given the ultimate gift. Like I am as humble as I can be with respect to anything that he's achieved. Uh, uh, in his life because I've achieved nothing compared to what he has. Um, so in that way, I'm truly proud of Ari. And, and I love talking about him because I can talk about him in the text of joy 
and happiness rather than sadness of our loss. And that's important. We celebrate his life every day and that will never stop. We're here today really climbing up Ben Nevis to raise awareness about organ donation. Something I'm passionate about and Bema is as well. We've been working on this for over five years. This is one of our campaigns. And to highlight that there is a disparity between the different ethnic minorities and religious groups regarding awareness of organ donation and also difference in donation. The reason organ promoting organ donation is important to me is because I see patients on both sides of the divide. So I see patients on dialysis waiting for a transplant and then I also see the, the change uh, or how quickly their life improves immediately after transplant and I just wish uh, you know we can give as many people waiting for a transplant that opportunity to have a better quality of life, to be able to live longer, not to be ruled by dialysis, to have uh, freedom to travel, freedom to eat and drink what they like uh, and I'm also quite uh, um, um, concerned about the waiting time because uh, uh, ethnic minorities actually have to wait longer on the waiting list uh, uh, because of uh, the difference in the blood group and the tissue type compared to a majority of the donors uh, in the UK who are of Caucasian origin and actually some patients just die on the waiting list uh, uh, waiting for an organ to come up. My name is Dr. Amr Hamid, I'm a cardiology consultant, I'm also one of the founding member of BIMA, British Islamic Medical Association as always a uh, senior advisor for EPIC team and team member for organ donation, which is what we are here today. We uh, noticed that um, black minority ethnic group uh, are low on the uh, organ donation register and uh, there's a lot of people waiting for that and unnecessarily uh, delay and sometimes and inevitably people might die because of that. So please, please consider that if you are from black minority ethnic group, consider donating your organs. If you are got worried about any organ, you can specialize, put that I want to donate this or that only. You have the freedom and even when you, if you die uh, and if things change, if your family want to re revisit the, that decision, your family can change that. So rest assured, if you want to put your name now, later on, if the family decided otherwise, they can do so. There's no obligation for that. Bima would like this film to be a talking point, like the start of a conversation, for people to watch this film and to go away thinking, this could be me in terms of someone that's affected in a, you know, a, through ill health and needs of transplant, or be in a position, think I could be in a position to help someone else and not save one life, but multiple lives after I've passed away. We want this film to be a talking point to just spur that discussion for people to watch it, to go away more informed, to go home, to talk to families and friends and just to ignite discussions about organ donation so we can get rid of the taboo that clouds this, this subject, some of the barriers, we need to overcome some of these barriers and those will, that will only happen when we start discussing it around with our family and friends.